So here I am, uh, finally getting the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my time on Falcon Crest. And thank you, thank you for all the questions you sent in. I've managed to sort of write down one or two of them, which I will hopefully be able to cover. But of course, what a lot of you wanted to know was, first and foremost, how I got the part. I'd come from Superman, been in England when we shot it, and spent a bit more time in England, until my then-husband, Rick Le Parmentier, really, really, really encouraged me to go to America, just for three months. He said, go to America, let everybody know who you are, because nobody recognised me. Because, of course, I had very long hair, and I wore a short-cropped wig, and people didn't recognise me, and I was very happy about that. But then I arrived in America, and of course, um, I didn't really know what Falcon Crest was. I'd never seen it. Um, I think it had been, the previous series had been on television in the afternoon, maybe, in, in England. But I certainly didn't know anything about it. But I did know about Jane Wyman, and she was a major, mega Hollywood star. And she was an absolute delight. I'm so pleased to report she was fun. We laughed together. Um, no nonsense. I think it's Tom, yes, he's written down there, that asked me about Jane and what I learned from her. Well, I have to say right now, I knew about punctuality, having been brought up with a theatre background, certainly my training was. And Jane Wyman was a stickler for timing. And there were one or two actresses who were very casual about it and sort of just arrived kind of round about the time that their call time was. And she did not take kindly to that. And she just gave a look. And her look was everything. It was quite withering. But I adored her. I actually adored all of the cast. I mean, how lucky am I? I made some wonderful friends. I mean, Susan Sullivan, Bob Foxworth, Abby Dalton. I mean, we all had such a brilliant time together. But anyway, I jumped ahead. So I went for an audition. I didn't know what I was going for and met David Selby, who I also didn't know who he was, but he was very charming. And we read the scene together. And then I forgot about it. And the following week, I was due to fly home. And this is absolutely true. I was going home in the evening. And at about uh, 3.30 in the afternoon, they phoned and said, well, you, you've got an episode of Falcon Crest. Because it was just one episode. They had said that they might write me in a bit more. But at the time, it was one episode. This is something that I wrote to my old school, Ulster Grammar School, who had asked me what it was like back there. I'm writing from Hollywood, California where I just started my first job in American television. And whilst the place isn't perhaps quite the same as it was in the days of the big film companies and the big stars whose names have become legend, there's still a great thrill and sense of achievement in arriving here and seeing for oneself the studio and setting foot on Sunset Boulevard for the first time. And knowing that for a while at least, I'm going to be part of all of it. I'm here to take part in several episodes of the TV show Falcon Crest, an earlier series of which I believe has been shown on English television and which in America is screened in nearly all the 51 states. So success in it can lead to many other openings and opportunities. The hours are long and the work rate high. For the quicker a TV program is produced, the less it costs. But everyone is very, very efficient and very helpful. And the butterflies I had when I first walked on the set were no different from the ones I had on my first entrance in Twelfth Night in the school play a number of years ago when I was 11. Well, there you go. So the excitement built because I didn't know what I was doing particularly, but I went in and I, I met with everybody and um, it was quite clear uh, quite early on, that my character was to be not so much a tough girl, but the Falcon Crest producers were rather capitalising on my image in Superman, which was as a tough girl. It was also as a leather-clad dominatrix. And the wardrobe department, the costume designer, did come up with the concept of me wearing um, a lot of leather and suede. And I think I'm correct in saying that I am the first person on primetime American television to have that particular look. So each week I would wear leather, suede, whatever. And it was so hot. The outfits weren't the most comfortable to wear, but they looked terrific and it went along with my image. And of course I had a PR. I had my own PR. I didn't work it out for a few weeks, but when I started to get more work from Falcon Crest, it was clear I needed somebody to look after me. And they immediately leapt on leather clad dominatrix, bad girl, super bitch, all of those. 
I'm delighted to say I've, I've been able to refer back to my scrapbooks and read all the remarks and most of the headings, which definitely portrayed me as this really sort of super vixen that had come onto the show. And the American public lapped it up. And because of it, I got a lot of opportunity to do many, many, many TV shows as it progressed. Now, I have to back up a minute and just tell you, I was not under contract. I was on what was called episodic. So I was asked to do an episode and at the end of the week, they would ask me if I wanted to do another episode. And so that continued. Obviously, because of the storyline, we were pretty sure that they were going to say at the end of the week, do you want to come in next week? Because that was the nature of the beast. But I wasn't under contract. So I wasn't getting the big bucks. I was just getting a relatively low rate. Oh, and I hated to read in the English press that I was making all this money because I certainly wasn't. But having said that, um, it, was a, it was a comfortable salary of which I was very, very grateful. So anyway, my image, they'd already decided on that sort of tough girl image and uh, a bit of a minx, I think, is the expression that was used. My hair, well, I don't know where my hair came from. As you know, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And certainly by the second season, I had got this enormous sort of thing up here. Um, I would go into work with flat hair. Um, I mean, not so much like this, but, but certainly not frou-frou at all. And they would back home and tease and this and that, and it got bigger and bigger. And to balance that, my shoulders got wider and wider and my earrings got bigger and bigger. And it was the eighties. So it was all perfect. So the first season, every week they would ask me, and this allowed me to have time off because, of course, if I wanted to do something else, I just said, whoops, sorry, I'm doing something else. Well, I wasn't so stupid as to, to uh, you know, turn them down, but I was able to do V, the miniseries, and also Conan the Destroyer. I'm not quite sure which order it's coming in. I'm, I'm hesitating. I know that Conan was very difficult to shoot. I don't know whether that was the first year or the second year probably the first year, because of course I was filming that in Mexico. So I would have to go down to Mexico City, I'd fly down, then I would fly back for three days on the set, work, then fly back to Mexico. But in those days, of course, I thought it was perfectly normal to jump on and off planes and jet around here and jet around there. It was very exciting. V, of course, the miniseries, that was another thing that once I had completed it, I don't exactly know when it was because my memory escapes me, but I know that they came back and they talked to my agents about the likelihood of me perhaps coming back to do more because that was just the miniseries. And my agent did talk to me, but I don't remember making a decision myself. It was sort of made for me. And they did point out that by the end of the year, uh, after a few episodes of Falcon Crest, and as I became more and more popular, I was to be offered a contract and it was only a year's contract, but I was offered a contract of that or V and it was pointed out that it would be much better for me to be seen on primetime television every Friday night, all of America was watching, than to do some sci-fi series, which of course, uh, before it came out, nobody watched sci-fi. I mean, it was the first big science fiction television show. Of course, now I realise how enormous it was and how long it lasts. But I chose Falcon Crest, or rather the others chose Falcon Crest for me. So my first year was great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I loved the outfits. One of you asked, I think it was Tom. Tom asked me about time off for TV. He also asked me about Jane Wyman. So Tom, you're a good fan. You know your stuff. Robert asked me about the comparison with Dynasty or Dynasties, Alexis. Well, of course, the press were bound to compare it. And of course, Falcon Crest loved it because it meant more talk about Falcon Crest. I was all over the television all the time, all the talk shows. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately, I look back now, it was all daft really, but I was a young English actress and Joan Collins was enormous star, still is. But they did rather capitalise on my English super bitch image and the press in England had a field day with it and were forever talking about the two of us and comparing us which of course there was no comparison because she is the queen of nighttime soaps I was purely walking in her shadow and that's all I'm going to say about it because I don't want to upset anybody any more than is necessary having said that 
the producers did rather use my image as bad girl. So if ever they wanted to get anything out or say anything in the press or let anybody know that they weren't thrilled about anything, um, it always seemed to come out of my mouth. Bad girl, Sarah Douglas says, super bitch says, this is this, this, this. So it created a bit of a buzz. For reasons that I've never really understood, they created a bit of a story about Gina Lola Brigida and it got into the press as if I said it. Now, I actually barely, barely knew the lady and somebody created a story which got into the papers. And I'm very pleased to say Gina herself said she couldn't understand why I would say such negative things about her as we hardly knew each other. And I'm delighted to say that um, I had a couple of good friends in the media over there. One of them, a very, very famous now sadly not with us, a gossip columnist called Liz Smith, who actually did print a little thing in her paper in the New York Post, which of course everybody read, saying how ridiculous it was. And of course, I hadn't made the remarks. Now, I have got a letter that I wrote to my mum, because I've got all the letters. I've got lots and lots of bits and bobs. My memory isn't great, but I'm going to just find this letter, if you'll just give me a minute, um, and read you this little bit that I wrote about Gina. Look at this. Napa Valley, Napa Valley Holiday Inn. That's where we were on location with Falcon Crest. And I wrote a letter to my mum. And it's only a little bit here, but I, I, it made me laugh because it says here, Gina Lol is very sweet, but doesn't understand a lot of what we're saying. She seems to be wearing a wig all the time. And quite a heavy makeup. She wears a lot of lipstick. I'm a fine one to talk, aren't I? She wears a lot of lipstick, but otherwise she's all right. I don't know what that means. So it's, as I said, she wears quite a lot of makeup, quite a lot of lipstick, but otherwise she's all right. Anyway, it says, I met her for the first time. She looked at my height and just said, Mamma Mia. So there you have it. No big deal with Gina, but the press jumped on it. They were able to make a big fuss out. And I was terribly upset. You know, this happened a lot. I've got the press cuttings downstairs. And I used to open up something, one of those sort of trashy newspaper magazines in America and go, oh, because there would be a story and it just wasn't true. I tried to go through life very quietly, very calmly. But sometimes I must say they got the better of me. So as time progressed on Park and Crest, of course, the press were everywhere. And I had come from England where really and truly nobody gave a damn. But in America, I was very high profile um, because, of course, Falcon Crest, as I mentioned earlier, was on Friday nights, prime time. Everybody watched it. It's not like today where you've got masses of content to choose from. Then it was pretty much the three networks, CBS, NBC and ABC. Anyway, they didn't exactly hound me, but I always had to be ready to be photographed. The paparazzi were pretty much everywhere you went, but then you knew where they were going to be. It was very rare that they popped up in a supermarket, although I have got the odd picture of me looking absolutely ghastly and doing a rude sign at them. But they didn't really want that. The paparazzi wanted to see you looking glam. They wanted to see you out with some gorgeous man. So I tried to oblige most of the time. And of course, after Conan, I got very friendly with Grace Jones and the paparazzi loved that. So that was just a, a continual sort of buzz from them. I didn't enjoy being labelled this sort of super bitch. But having said that, you know, I did the David Letterman show and the Johnny Carson show with Joan Rivers and all the different talk shows. In fact, I did every show. So people began to know me. They were starting to see me, not Ursa, because, you know, as I said earlier, they didn't really recognise me before. Now they were seeing me out and about, albeit not with the big hair, because believe me, at the end of the day, my hair went back to being pretty flat and straight. But I had to be prepared for the fact that people stared at me. And it was very uncanny at the beginning. I couldn't quite work out why people stared. I wasn't used to it. But everybody knew what I was up to and people reported on it and cleaners sold stories about me and... Well, lots of bits of information were sold to the National Enquirer about me, and that was just the way things were. But on the whole, the experiences on Falcon Crest were fabulous, and it obviously led to lots of opportunities. And one of the great things we did were the Star Games things. Of course, Lorenzo Lama is a terrifically good sportsman. Billy Moses, frighteningly good. And we were all invited to take part in these events, which I somewhat naively thought that I could do because when I was about, uh, well, what would I have been, 11, 12, 13, 14, I was in the Stratford Athletic Club and I used to do a lot of cross-country running and a lot of 
uh, long jumping and I really thought I was terribly sporty. Uh, the only thing is I had forgotten that I was now in my 30s, early 30s, and I wasn't really that fit. But I got involved and each week I would take part and each week my team would get through, which was agony because it meant I had to do it all again the following week. I mean, it's really pretty embarrassing to be I don't know whether it was in the swimming or in, the, I think it was in the running race where one of the famous commentators said, there goes Sarah Douglas going nowhere. And that stuck with me for the rest of my life. There goes Sarah Douglas going nowhere. But you know what? We won. I won a car, lots of money. I broke my wrist. Oh, that was great, wasn't it? I mean, that was in a running race. How embarrassing is that? I used to, when I was 13 or 14, I used to come out of the blocks and the running races and the relay races. And I just assumed that I could still do it. And of course, there I am on national television. I came out of the blocks and I never managed to stand up again. I just came out of the blocks, ran with my nose almost to the ground, fell to the ground, onto my wrist, broke it. And that was that. So I broke my wrist, but I won a car. So now many of you are very intrigued as to what happened to me at the end of the second season. Now I must just explain that the second season, that's the second year, indeed the producers did come and they offered me a contract for one year. So that meant I knew that I was going to be working, I knew that I was going to be paid. It was also a very difficult year for me because in that year my marriage broke up. I wasn't really able to save it. My mother, bless her, got married again, having been on her own for 26, 27 years since my father, and she got married again, and I wasn't able to take time off to fly home for the wedding. So I missed my mum's wedding. And then very, very sadly, about nine months later, her husband, Paul, died, and I wasn't able to get home for the funeral. So I felt, in the second year, I felt very, very trapped. I mean, you have to understand, it was a brilliant lifestyle. I was mixing with all the glam and glitterati of Hollywood. I was able to do quite a crossover because of my film connections. Because back then, you know, the movie stars stayed separate pretty much from the TV stars. Now, of course, everybody's mixed up. But back then, you didn't really do both. Um, I did. And I was able to mix my movie star friends up, of which I had some pretty big high rollers that would come over to the house. and. I enjoyed a pretty good time. However, it was a difficult time. And one of the things that I really sensed was that I was stuck on a show. The cartel had gone. I had a good storyline and suddenly that storyline seemed to, well, for a fact, they decided to get rid of it. There were issues with it, which I don't need to go into, but it was to do with the background of the story, nothing to do with me or the actors, but it was a background story. They decided to get rid of it because the public weren't really enjoying it. So that part of the story suddenly went and I suddenly found myself just being Richard Channing's assistant and not really doing anything. So I felt very trapped. Here I was stuck in Hollywood, stuck on this show, not able to be at my mum's wedding, not able to be at the funeral, not able to save my marriage. Everything seemed pretty ghastly. So as it came to the end of the year, uh, we started looking for other work. And as I recall, I was booked and asked to do a pilot for a TV show. Now, this means that literally they don't you don't know it's going to become a series, but they're hopeful. And of course, playing my twin was the lovely Jane Badler, which of course I did V with, and we were so excited to be working together. And I needed a tiny little bit of time off from Falcon Crest to do this. Uh, we needed to work it into the last few days of my shooting at the end of the second season. The producers weren't particularly obliging and I really wanted to do it. And they couldn't find their way to release me to do it. I can't quite recall how it all went down. I've got a little letter here, another one to my mum, and I'm just gonna read it to you because this is actually how it was. Mum, I told you on the phone today how the producers of FC had asked me if I'd be interested in doing a few more episodes. When my agent went to them about the other job, they had showed concern because they said, if I did the other job, wouldn't that mean I wouldn't be available for any more Falcon Crest? My agent pointed out that they had told me they wouldn't be asking me back for another season. David S has gone to the producers and told them how much he loves to work with me and how good I make him seem. Ironic, isn't it, Mum? Well, I'm going to leave it at that. 
ironic, eh? There were issues. There were issues. But the fact of it was, I wasn't being offered another couple of years or even another year. They were saying, come back and do a few episodes. I wanted to do the other show. They wouldn't release me. Again, if the pilot had happened and gone to series, uh, it would have affected my Falcon Crest uh, episodes. So because they wouldn't release me, I couldn't do the pilot. So that was the end of that. I was pretty pissed off about that and didn't want to do any more. That's all there was to it. I felt I'd had a bad year. I wasn't very happy. And indeed, they did replace me, as you know, um, briefly. I, I didn't watch the episode. I know that the character Pamela Lynch seemed to be much shorter than she was the previous season. And it appears that the public, thank God, did not accept because it would have been a bit of a strange thing. But anyway, so that's why I didn't go back. I did my last episode. I went off to Stratford-on-Avon. Oh, there's another story for you. I'll tell you that. So the last episode of Falcon Crest, of which I've never seen, it was a really difficult time for me. I was emotionally very unhappy. I was sick of it all, quite honestly. I was sick of being told what I had to do. <laughs> no surprises there. But the point of it is, in the last episode, they have me going off to my manor house in Stratford-on-Avon. And one of the lovely things about this story is, having not seen the episode, many, many months later, I went home to visit, because of course I'm living in America for 20 odd years, I went home to visit my mum in Stratford-on-Avon, and I was out in town with her, shopping. I didn't know that the previous week, the episode had aired where Pamela Lynch I think David Selby says, go off to your manor house in Stratford-upon-Avon. That was the producer's little in-joke about Stratford. But, of course, it was there for the whole world to see. And consequently, I'm in town with my mum and a coachload of American tourists were getting off and suddenly spotted Pamela Lynch. Well, they were very excited. I had to make a bolt for it because they were after me. They thought they'd, they'd cornered me. God knows what they'd have done if they'd got hold of me. And of course, the myth continued because then my sister got involved in a little delicatessen in Stratford just for a couple of years. She had a whim, as you do. And so to get her a bit of press, I also went and did a week's work behind the bacon slicer and got lots of lovely press for her in People magazine. They were very generous, and that then sealed my fate. Fans of Falcon Press really did think that Pamela Lynch had gone off to Stratford-on-Avon and was ending up working in a shop, slicing bacon. And she got her just rewards. Die! You asked me if I had any input into the character. I don't think I did. I mean, it was very much me in terms of, I was a little bit cheeky, a little bit naughty. I got away with murder. Not literally, I hasten to add. But I don't recall ever being consulted on a script. It would just arrive and, and that would be that. But of course, they watched how you progressed in the story, on the set, who the chemistry was with. And of course, I did have a great chemistry with David Selby. I made one of my best friends ever on the very first day on Falcon Crest, who was Mitchell. Dear Mitchell El Mahadi, who was the medic on the set, we became firm friends and we still, I just spoke to him last night, I made some wonderful friends there. I had a lot of fun. It was the 80s. We were quite naughty, but I had a blast. As far as the outfits went, as I explained to you, that was very much them. I love the fact they put me in colours. I did have a little bit of a say in that, but the earrings, I mean, the big earrings and the glitz and the glamour and everything, it was just fun to get dressed up. It was a terrific experience. And it's wonderful to know that there are still lots of Falcon Crest fans out there because it's about as far removed from Ursa as we can get. Or is it? I hope I've answered some of your questions. I'm sure there's lots more to be said, but this'll do for the moment. <laughs> <laughs>